Good morning, good morning to you, you. Good morning, good morning to you, you. Good morning, good morning. Won't you share with a friend or two? Good morning, good morning to you, you. Good morning, good morning, good morning to you, you. Good morning. Good morning to you and many more. Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Daring Dialogues Black Table Talk Edition. I am your host today, Shante Charles. I hope that you're having a great and wonderful day and morning. We are talking today, we are in part three of Hoodoo Origin and understandings. I want to encourage you to take a moment and do what I'm doing, which is sharing the broadcast out. Let's take a moment to do that. And we are going to jump right into our topic and our subject matter for today. Grand Rising, Ashe, Ashe, Good Morning, Blessings, all of those good things. I hope again that you all are having a great and wonderful day. I'm taking a moment to share this broadcast out to my other platforms. And we're gonna be in part three today. We've been taking a look at hoodoo, understanding it, understanding its connection to the black American experience, understanding its connection to those of us who have been descended from the enslaved. And we are going to dive a little bit deeper. I've been trying to break this up because it is quite a bit of information. If you have not caught part one and part two, I encourage you to go back to those parts because I'm not going to reiterate any of that. I'm going to just jump right into our second part. Today, we are talking about tools of hoodoo, tools of hoodoo. And we're gonna dive a little bit into how those tools are also somewhat a part of people's spiritual practice. Now, you might not know that it's a part of your spiritual practice. You might've been doing some of these things already as a part of your spiritual practice and you did not know that you were doing them. So we're going to hop into it again. I'm going to shift myself and make myself a little tiny something here in the corner. And we're going to focus our attention on our presentation. So I don't want to be much of a distraction. So I'm going to be down here in the corner. I will be checking my comments occasionally, but I am primarily going to be focused on the lecture part. And then I will take a look at the comments and read some of the comments that are coming through. And hopefully we will have some time, maybe about 10 to 15 minutes toward the end. I will drop the invite link in the the comments. And that way, if you want to come on and speak on a particular topic, you may do so. However, just keep in mind, we do operate in civil discourse here and we don't use profanity. So if either one of those things is is happening and I invite you on and you can't follow the directions, then we will just politely invite you off. All right. So here we go. Let me make sure that I am in the right space here. All right. So again, I will be kind of occasionally looking down at my comments just to make sure I'm not missing anything. 
If you would like to support this broadcasting program, the information to do that is scrolling along. I'm not going to be making any announcements. You can read. I believe that my audience is pretty intelligent. So, all right, here we go. Hoodoo, origins and understandings. As we talked last time about the fact that hoodoo does come, it does have an origin place and it does have an origin point. It comes from the Bakongo people, the Bakongo people out of Central Africa. These were Bantu speaking peoples, okay? And so other Bantu Congo practices that are present in hoodoo are the use of what is called conjure canes. In Central Africa among the Bantu Congo, the Banganga ritual healers use what was called ritual staffs. These ritual staffs are called conjure canes in hoodoo practice. But it comes from, again, the Bakongo people in Central Africa. This is something that was carried over through the transatlantic slave trade, still carrying over into our culture. All right. These ritual staffs were called conjure canes and hoodoo which conjure spirits and heal people. They were believed to have used these canes in order to conjure something spiritually and to heal people. Now, when I took a look at this cane, I often thought about, um, in context, I often thought about Moses and his use of his stick to part the Red Sea. So that was kind of the imagery that immediately came to my mind when I saw this. Uh, the Baganga healers in Central Africa became the conjure doctors and herbal healers in African-American communities in the United States. So that's who they became. Let's take a look at some more tools and practices. At the Stagville Plantation in Durham County, North Carolina, Archaeologists found artifacts made by enslaved Americans, African Americans, that linked to spiritual practices found in West Africa. The artifacts found was a divining stick, a walking stick, and cowrie shells. Stagville Plantation was owned by a wealthy slaveholding family called the Benahan family. They enslaved 900 African American people. Now, you have to put this into perspective that during this time, most of these plantations probably had anywhere between, um, if you were doing well, well as a slaveholder, you probably had anywhere between 25 to 100 people on your plantation. These people had 900 enslaved people. Stagville was one of many large slave plantations in the American South. Inside the Benahan house, a walking stick was found, get this, get this, placed in between the walls to curse the Benahan family. But we say our ancestors just didn't have any sense to know that what was happening to them was wrong. Okay. So they found this stick. It was placed in between the walls to curse the Benahan family for what they were doing, which was enslaving human beings. An enslaved person secretly placed a walking stick to put evil spirits on their enslavers, putting a curse on the family for enslaving them. Now I'm wondering where their descendants are and what's going on. I'm just saying. The walking stick was carved into an image of a West African snake spirit or deity called Dambala. In West Central Africa and in African-American communities, only initiates trained in the secrets of the serpent and spirits were allowed to have a conjure stick. And again, I can almost look at this practice and think about what was happening when you look at um, the Old Testament and you look at 
uh, the children of Israel and how at one point, you know, when when they were dealing with sickness or dealing with disobedience, they were told to hang a serpent. And when the people would look on the serpent, they would be healed. I'm not sure if some of this might come from that. It could be. I'm not sure. But I'm just thinking out loud. All right. So apparently there was some kind of initiation into the secrets of the serpent. Those people were allowed to have this conjure stick. So everybody did not have this. Everybody did not use this. These sticks conjured illness and healing, and the spirit of a conjure stick could warn the conjurer of impending danger. Cowrie shells were found on the site and was used by enslaved Africans to connect with the spiritual element of water to ensure spiritual guidance over bodies of water. So we know that in West Africa, cowrie shells were also used for money and um, to correspond to African water spirits. So if you wanted to, you know, maybe dive a little bit more in your own time into the significance of cowrie shells, I encourage you to do that. But those were just some basic general practices. Conjure sticks and beliefs. The practice of carving snakes onto conjure sticks to remove curses, evil spirits, and bring healing was found in African-American communities in the Sea Islands as well among the Gullah Geechee people. Snake reverence in African-American hoodoo originated from West African societies. Another practice in hoodoo that has its origins from West Africa is to um, moisten conjure bags and luck balls with, with whiskey or rum. And we're gonna look at what that um, luck ball looks like in just a moment. It is believed that conjure bags and luck balls have a spirit and to keep its spirit alive, conjurers would feed them whiskey once a week. The practice has its roots from the Guinea coast of Africa. The practice of foot tracking in hoodoo also has its origins from Ghana. A person's foot track is used to send someone away by mixing their foot track with herbs, roots, and insects, specific ingredients used in hoodoo to send someone away so they don't return. And grind into a powder and place the powder in a container and throw it into a flowing river that leaves town or flows away from town. And they, it was believed that in a few days that person would leave town. Among the Shi people in Ghana, spirit possession is not limited to people. And when they say spirit possession, they're talking about um, objects that they believe contain spirit. OK, they're not talking about demon possession, two different things. Um, spirit possession is not limited to people, but objects, inanimate and animate, can become possessed by spirits. This belief is also detailed among the Hebrew in the book of Exodus. The same belief among black people in the South was documented by folklorist, a folklorist by the name of Puckett. All right. Let us continue. Conjure balls. So this is somewhat what a conjure ball would look like. On plantations, these conjure balls were um, wrapped in red. Sometimes like this one here is like wrapped in a yarn. Some of them were wrapped in flannel, rags, or bundles, and they were buried or they were placed on a property of a targeted person. These are also called jack balls or luck balls. It contains a collection of personal items. So within this ball, you might have something of the person's items that's rolled in wax or wrapped in string. Often enough string is left for these jack balls to be hung. Jack balls originated as a talisman in the Congo, and they were bound with a specific number of knots. Again, this was placed on the property of a targeted person or they were buried on the property of a targeted person. Yard decor. I just got a book on this recently. Let me see if I can shrink this down a little bit, change us up a little bit here. 
for one second. Um, as I was reading, I came across this book here called No Space Hidden. All right. The Spirit of African-American Yard Work. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about why do we have African-Americans that have all of these things all over their yard and decorations. Well, it's not just decorations for some. So let's take a look. All right. Shrink me back down. So yard decor. If you have been in South Carolina, if you've traveled South Carolina, North Carolina, you have probably seen some of this, maybe as you're driving down the hall, the uh, highway and there are some houses that maybe sit closer to um, the highway or some rural world, you might see this, all right? But Congo spiritual protections influence African-American yard decorations. In Central Africa, Bantu Con Congo people decorated their yards and entrances to doorways with baskets and broken shiny items to protect from evil spirits and thieves. This practice is the origin of the bottle tree in hoodoo. Throughout the American South and African American neighborhoods, there are some houses that have bottle trees and baskets placed at entrances to doorways for spiritual protection against conjure and evil spirits. In addition, in Kisi culture influenced jar container magic. An African-American man in North Carolina buried a jar under the steps with water and string in it for protection. If someone conjured him, he said that the string would turn into a snake. The man interviewed called it Incabera as far as the process. All right. So if you've ever seen this, you can put some hearts on the screen or you can say, yes, I've seen this practice before. Um, I know I have seen it um, passing through North Carolina. All right. Here's something else you might not know is associated with hoodoo. This is called haint. Blue. This particular color is called Haint Blue. Now, uh, when I bought my home, my entire, one of my entire rooms in my home is painted in this Haint Blue. I did not know about Haint Blue until I did a little bit of studying on it. So Haints, what are they? Haints are supposedly unearthly beings at one time that had been human. They could be ghosts that might prowl a property or mount and ride humans like a horse. Haint blue is a color that is used to keep the spirit away. They are believed to see the color. This particular spirit is believed to see the color and mistake it for water and stay away from your home. This belief that spirits won't cross water or can't swim may come from the scripture where swine jump, jump into the water after spirits are transferred into them. Nobody kind of really knows exactly where that belief comes from, but it is associated with this particular color. Oftentimes, Gullah Geechee people in the Sea Islands will paint their houses blue to ward off the spirit of the haint. Again, sometimes it can be um, painted on the top uh, ceiling of a porch. Some people's ceilings are painted blue. And like I said, when I bought my home, one of my entire rooms, the room I'm sitting in now, is painted in this haint blue. So, um, yeah, it is it is very interesting. So if you see this color, and let me see if I can blow it up a little bit more. Yeah. There you go. So this color is so popular that... Paint companies already have this color. Uh, Sherwin Williams um, calls it rain. Benjamin Moore calls it palladium blue. These are paint companies. Bear calls it day flower. Um, Benjamin Moore is another one. Woodlawn blue. Sherwin Williams atmospheric blue. Okay, so this is this is something that is well known, and you know. Paint companies are like, hey, this is the blue y'all want. We'll serve it up for you. 
All right, let's bring this back down a little bit. So it's called Haint Blue. Let's talk a little bit about language. How does language play a part? How is how has hoodoo seeped over even into language? Historians from Southern Illinois University in the Africana Studies Department documented about 20 title words from the Kakongo language that are in the Gullah language. Now, you if you've been with us for a minute, you know we've already been learning about the Gullah Geechee culture in general. All right. These title words indicate continued African traditions in hoodoo and conjure. The title words are spiritual in meaning. In Central Africa, spiritual priests and spiritual healers are called Nganga in Central Africa. In the South Carolina Low Country among Gullah people, a male conjurer is called Nganga. Some Kikongo words have an N or an M in the beginning of the word. However, when Bantu Congo people were enslaved in South Carolina, the letters N and M were dropped from some of the title names. For example, in Central Africa, the word to refer to spiritual mothers is Mama Bondo. In the South Carolina Low Country in African American communities, the word for a spiritual mother is Mama Bondo without the M. In addition, during enslavement, it was documented that there was a Kakongo speaking enslaved community in Charleston, South Carolina. Where are their descendants today? That is what I would like to know. Another tradition that comes straight out of Africa is naming. Other African cultural survivors among the Gullah people is giving their children African names. Linguists have noticed identical or similar sounding names in the Gullah Geechee Nation that can be traced to Sierra Leone, a country in West Africa. Some African Americans in South Carolina and Georgia continue to give their children African names as they should, if that is where their descendants are from. This is done for spiritual and cultural reasons. The spiritual reason is for their ancestors to provide their children spiritual power and spiritual protection. The cultural reason is so their children will know, get this, what region in Africa their ancestry is from. Yeah. Now, one thing I do know in terms of naming children i know it was a, a heavily thing a heavily thought thing in my community that you don't name a child after a um deceased person that may have passed away in a very like terrible way or they may have passed away um from some kind of long-term illness because you did not want that child to take on whatever that was or whatever those characteristics were. You also didn't name your children after someone who had a bad reputation in your family. Like you just didn't do that. So those are some things I remember growing up that was like a big, a big deal. Water spirits. The earliest mention of water spirits here in the Americas the earliest known record of Simbi spirits was recorded in the 19th century by Edmund Ruffin, who was a wealthy slaveholder from Virginia who traveled to South Carolina to keep the slave economic system viable through ag agricultural reform. In Ruffin's records, he spelled Simbi, C-Y-M-B-E-E, -E, because he did not know the original spelling of the word. In his records, he recorded a few conversations he had had with some of the enslaved about this particular water spirit. So let's take a look at what this water spirit was about. Simbi spirits can help with healing, fertility, and prosperity. Baptismal services are done by rivers to invoke the blessings of the Simbi spirit to bring healing, fertility, and prosperity to people. 
West Africans and African Americans wear white clothing to invoke the water spirit during water ceremonies. So remember that crossover we talked about, about how some of y'all are already doing these practices and you don't know it, or you're not aware, or you're not aware of the origin of those practices. Well, this would be one, okay? Wearing white, going to get your baptism in the river, both things of which I did. Um, this is a West African practice, okay? It is. If you did it, you did it. It's a West African practice. Don't throw away your baptism. <laughs> Let me get going because somebody's going to be mad. Anyway, Simbi spirits reside in forests, mountains, and the water and are responsible for the life and growth of nature. These beings are feared and respected. Simbi spirits are the guardians of the lands and the people that reside there. If someone disrespected a Simbi by destroying the natural habitats, that Simbi could take their life by drowning them in water. Now, I can't remember the place, but I know it's in Georgia. It's a particular lake that had an had a uh, African American community where they they um, basically covered that whole town or covered that space in water. And I want to say Usher's child, somebody's child recently died in that same water space. And several people have died there. Like it's people are like, just don't go in the water. Somebody can uh, tell me what, what water space that is, but it's in Georgia. There it is. I knew somebody was going to know. Lake Lanier. All right. Thank you for putting that up there. So it is believed that if someone disrespected this spirit by this, that the Simbi would take their life by drowning them in water. Um, to obtain the powers of the Simbi spirits, the Congo people in Central Africa and African Americans in Georgia and South Carolina, low country, collect rocks and seashells to create a space to respect this water spirit. So I know oftentimes people associate um, protection of the environment, protection of the natural habitat with just Native American culture, but this is also true of West African culture, okay? There is a, there is a real connection to water, to protecting water, to protecting spaces of life because water is life. OK, um, Kimball says Kimball Wright Max says a water ceremony is held in Hampton, Virginia every year. Don't know much about it. OK, um, Hampton is one of those places where hoodoo is in a uh, pretty heavy operation. So it could have something to do with that. All right. And this carving here is a carving that is supposed to represent the Simbi spirit. So I don't want to bypass that. Notice the Simbi looks like the mermaid, okay? Ancestors, we talked about this before, ancestor veneration. Veneration is not worship. Veneration is respect, giving honor, paying tribute. These are things that I hope people are already doing in their life when it, re when it comes to their elders or when it comes to people that have passed on but it's not worship, okay? Other spirits revered in hoodoo are the end. Talk about that, because it's very interesting. Ancestors can intercede in the lives of people by providing guidance and protection. The practice of ancestral veneration in hoodoo originated from African practices. However, it is believed that if ancestors are not venerated, they could possibly cause trouble in their families' lives. Ancestors are venerated through prayers, through offerings. In hoodoo, ancestors can appear in people's dreams to provide information and guidance. Now, put some hearts on the screen, because I this has happened to me repeatedly over and over and over. Put some hearts on the screen if 
you have dreamed of your ancestor. If your ancestor has appeared in your dream and given you information that you did not have before or gave you guidance on something in a dream, hand raised. There's actually a term for that, which I learned about as I was doing this study. Okay. And I I haven't had an ancestor come to me in a dream and then it not be true. Or they've told me something and I've had to go to the person who's alive and ask them about it. And they were able to give me more information or they were able to warn me of something in a dream and I listened. And I was spared from what happened. So this is a phenomenon that does happen with people. Now, this is not really talked much about, but I do want to talk about this just very, very briefly. Islamic influence in hoodoo. Oftentimes we hear about Christian influence in hoodoo. And as we said in a previous lecture, it depends on what a person's faith underpinnings might be that would that might determine how hoodoo is operating in their life. OK, as a result of the transatlantic slave trade, some West African Muslims that practice Islam were enslaved in the United States as well. Prior to their arrival at the American South or to the American South. West African Muslims blended Islamic beliefs with traditional West African spiritual practice. On plantations in the American South, enslaved West African Muslims did keep some of their traditional Islamic culture. They practiced their Islamic prayers, they wore turbans, and the men wore traditional wide leg pants. So sometimes if you look really closely at some of the etchings and things from that period, you will see some men with the turban on and those wide leg pants. Some enslaved African Muslims practice hoodoo. Instead of using Christian prayers, Islamic prayers were used. Enslaved black Muslim conjure doctors, Islamic attire was different from the other enslaved, which made them easy to identify and ask for conjure services regarding protection from slaveholders. The Mandingo or the Mandinka were the first Muslim ethnic group imported from Sierra Leone in West Africa to the Americas. Mandingo people were known for their powerful conjure bags called Grease Grease, later called Mojo Bags in the United States. The Bambara people are an ethnic group of the Mandinka that influenced the making of these bags. Words in hoodoo in reference to charm bags come from the Bambara language. For example, the word Zin Zin, spoken in Louisiana Creole actually means a powerful amulet. The Mande word marabout in Louisiana means a spiritual teacher. During the slave trade, some Mandingo people were able to carry their grease grease bags with them when they boarded the slave ships heading to the Americas, bringing the practice to the United States. Fellow enslaved persons went to them for their conjure services, requesting them to make grease grease bags or mojo bags for protection against the cruelties of enslavement. All right. Now this is a particular kind of um, mojo bag. This was called the nation sack. It's still used today. All right. A nation sack is a kind of spiritual bag that is used in hoodoo practice. The difference between a mojo bag and a nation sack bag is it is only supposed to be used by women and would contain personal effects like money, other items. Um, as you can kind of see in the picture here, you've got money. You might have some stones. You might have a rabbit's foot, some other things. And this bag was originally hung from the waist of a woman's skirt or between a woman's legs. It was also called a mojo hand. The nation sack. All right. Something else used, we're talking about tools of hoodoo today. John the Conqueror. If you've ever heard anybody talk about John the Conqueror, we're gonna talk a little bit about this particular herbal plant. 
John the Conqueror root comes in three varieties, high John, low John, and chewing John. Often the variety is used to determine, uh, is determined by local availability. Chewing John is a member of the ginger family and is used to treat things like stomach aches and influence legal decisions. So again, remember hoodoo has a medicinal practice and then it also has people's spiritual or belief practice. So it depends on who's using it and for what. Low John is typically made of trillium wildflower root. High John is derived from the woody root of morning glory. Once dried, it resembles the male parts. High John is often used in sexual spells. So again, you have people that use it for something like treating a stomach ache. And then you have people that say, oh, I'm going to use this to cast a spell. In African-American folklore, John the Conqueror was a trickster who outsmarted his slave masters. The root can be used for a variety of purposes. Carrying it with you is believed to help you conquer all obstacles in your path. Gamblers swear by John the Conqueror root. So again, some people are using it for luck. Some people are using it because it's actually a medicinal treatment for stomach aches. Who was John the Conqueror? In African-American folk stories, High John the Conqueror was an African prince who was kidnapped from Africa and enslaved in the United States. He was a trickster and used his wit and charm to deceive and outsmart his slaveholders. After the American Civil War, before High John the Conqueror returned to Africa, he told the newly freed enslaved that if they ever needed his spirit for, free, for freedom, his spirit would reside in a route they could use. According to some scholars, the origin of High John the Conqueror may have originated from African male deities like Alegua, who is a trickster spirit in West Africa. By the 20th century, white drugstore owners began selling High John the Conqueror products with the image of a white king on their labels, thereby commercializing hoodoo and whitewashing the origin of the story of High John. And what's new in 2023? All right. Sidebar, when it comes to hoodoo, there is a belief in hoodoo called in call or being born veiled. This was something I heard about kind of in passing, but I did not understand it until I kind of went and looked at it a little bit more. So I do want to bring this out. And the practice is called augury um, that is associated with children that are born in call. What does in call mean? So let's talk about that. A baby born in call is a baby, is what is called a veiled birth, also known as a mermaid birth. This is a child that is born in a completely intact amniotic sac, meaning that the water bag never broke. The, water, the mother's water never broke and the baby is born in its complete amniotic sac that is completely sealed, i.e. baby in a bubble. So people believe that when a child was born this way, that there was going to be something special about that child or that that child would have what they call second sight or that that child would be prophetic. Yes, born with a veil in call, born with a veil. Some people call it mermaid birth. Um, it's basically the mother's water sack never broke. Her water never broke. And the child was delivered completely encapsulated in their amniotic sac. Okay. So because of that, that baby was said to have had some kind of special, you know, something special would be happening with that child. This was what they believed. OK, that the child would be have second sight or what we might call prophetic sight or some kind of insight 
Okay. Now the practice augury is the practice of is deciphering phenomena or omens that are believed to foretell the future, often signifying the advent of change. Before his rebellion, Nat Turner would have these auguries or he would have visions and omens from the spirit. For him, he said it was the, he said it was the spirit of God from the spirit to free the enslaved people through armed resistance. So it wasn't just Nat Turner just going around and saying, oh, I think all these people need to, to die. He said that he was having these visions about the need to free the enslaved through armed resistance. In African-American communities, a child born with a call over their face or a veil over their face is believed to have psychic gifts to see spirits and see into the future. This belief in the call on a baby's face bring psychic gifts was found also in West Africa, in Benin, in Dahomey. So again, this is something that has carried over from West Africa into the African-American community. And though you may hear people talk about this, it has its origins in West Africa. I just want to, you know, hopefully you're seeing how some of these things um, have carried over Regardless of what has happened to us as a people, there are still some practices and beliefs that are that have a through line to the motherland. We didn't just make these things up, Black people. They have an origin place. After the baby is born, the call is taken off the baby's face and is preserved and used to drive away or, or banish ghosts. It is believed a child born at midnight will have second sight or extrasensory perception about events. If you're in the Christian community, you would probably say prophetic. If you're not, you might say second sight, you might say um, psychic abilities, you might say clairvoyance, and there are different kinds of clair um, clairs. All right, another tool of hoodoo is the Bible. The Holy Bible is the most powerful book in hoodoo. Why? Because as we looked at in the last two sessions, these people were already practicing Christian beliefs. They were already practicing Christian beliefs. Just let that sit for a moment. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, most practitioners are Christians, and they brought their pre-colonial belief with them to the Americas. It is important to say pre-colonial because I'm continuing to hear Black people say that Christianity was forced on all of us. It was not. <laughs> and we need to stop saying that. Was it forced on some people? Yes. But the people who are operating in these practices, they had a pre-colonial belief in Christ. Bibles. And you can put some hearts on the screen or you can say, yes, I've seen this. These are some things that people do when they are operating and practicing hoodoo. People do this stuff and they might not know it's hoodoo, but it is. Bibles are often left open to important verses and position in a specific geographic orientation. The Psalms are far and away the most popular part of the Bible in Hoodoo. These ancient songs attributed to King David and others can be used for everything from attracting fortune to vanquishing enemies to curing physical and spiritual ailments as people declare the word of God over themselves. They believe there is power in the word of God. Now, if you've been in any black church, you have heard people actually say that. They wouldn't just say there's power in the name of Jesus. They will also say there is power in the word. Both written word and recited word. So if you're going to call hoodoo de uh, demonic, you're going to have to call yourself demonic if you're doing any of this. Okay. 
a tool for deliverance and revolution. In Hoodoo, all hold that the Bible is the great conjure book in the world. It has many functions for the practitioner, not the least of which is a source of spells. This is particularly evident given the importance of the book, Secrets of the Psalms in Hoodoo Culture. This book provides instructions for using psalms for things such as safe travel, for headaches, for marital relationships. The Bible, however, is not just a source of spiritual works, but it is itself a conjuring talisman for many. It can be taken to the crossroads, carried for protection, or even left open at specific pages while facing specific directions. This informant provides an example of both uses. So this is a statement taken from someone who was using the scriptures in their practice. This is what they said. Whenever I'm afraid of someone doing me harm, I read the 37 Psalms and I, and I close leaves open the Bible with the head of it turned to the east as many as three days. So are there people who take the scriptures and use them as a talisman? Yes. Are there people who take the scriptures and read the scriptures in order to, you know, cover their household or offer protection? Are there people who read the scriptures over their children before they go out the door? You don't have to answer that. I'm going to keep going. Author Theophilus, excuse me, author Theophis Harold Smith explained in his book, Conjuring Culture, Biblical Formations in Black America, that the Bible's place is an important tool in hoodoo for African-American spiritual and physical liberation. The Bible was used in slave religion as a formula that provided information on how to use herbs and conjure, how to use the Bible for specific results and spirits to bring about change in the lives of people. This is a continued practice today. Root workers, also known as herbalists, remove curses reading scriptures from the Bible. At the same time as root workers can remove the curse using the Bible, they can also place curses on people with the Bible. So are there people using the scriptures to declare and speak forth healing in people's life? Absolutely. Are there people using scriptures to bring forth and declare curses over people? Absolutely. Why? Because it is a tool. It is. It's a tool. And depending on, again, what your faith is, what your belief is, what your practice is, what is underpinning you, everybody is not using scripture for good purposes and good intent. So I want to be clear on that. So just because you see a Bible in someone's space or you see a Bible in someone's house or you see somebody carrying a little small Bible, it doesn't mean that they are using it with godly intent. Just want to say that. All right. God. Since the 15th century, there has been Christian influence in hoodoo, thought going back all the way to the Congo. African-American Christian conjurers, conjurers believe their powers to heal, hex, trick, and divine comes from God. This is particularly evident in relation to God's providence and his role in retributive justice. For example, though there are strong ideas of good versus evil, cursing someone to cause their death might not be considered a malignant act. Again, this is based on who is practicing. There are some people who will tell you, I don't use the scriptures. I don't use any of the scriptures to curse people. I pray the scriptures. I might declare something over somebody to wish them well or wellness or health, but I don't use scriptures to curse people. Well, there are people who do that. Just saying. There are. So you need to understand that. 
Now, this is the part where some people are, um, they might get a little set upset, but let's see. We, we'll, we might have to stop here and hold it for part four because I am running out of time. This practice in hoodoo of combining African traditional beliefs with the Christian faith is defined as Afro-Christianity. So when someone says, you all are not practicing the same kind of Christianity as the white evangelical, they would be absolutely, absolutely true <laughs> in saying that. African traditional beliefs with the Christian faith is defined as Afro-Christianity. During slavery, free and enslaved black hoodoo doctors identified as Christian and some root workers were pastors. Root workers, again, herbalists. Root workers, herbalists. Root workers, herbalists. <laughs> were pastors. By identifying as Christian, African-American conjurers were able to hide their hoodoo practices in the Christian religion. I'm going to go ahead and say they weren't hiding anything. It was in the open. Now, maybe 100 years ago, they would have been hiding, and we'll talk about that in part four. But this is in the open. Okay? The beginnings of the African-American church has its roots in African traditions. When Africans were enslaved in America, they brought their religious worldviews with them that was synchronized with Christianity. These African worldviews in black churches are ancestral spirits that can be petitioned through prayer for assistance in life, spirit possession. These are African worldviews. These African worldviews that you see in the black church are ancestral spirits that can be petitioned through prayer for assistance in life, now, I don't know of a whole lot of black churches that actually petition ancestral spirits. I don't know. I can't tell you any of them. Spirit possession. Do we believe, do people believe that you can be possessed of a spirit in the black church other than the Holy Spirit? Yes, they do. They believe that. Laying on of hands to bring forth healing. If you've ever been in a Pentecostal or charismatic black church, you're going to see the laying on of hands for healing. And you're also going to see some application of oil. The static forms of worship, shouting, dancing, rolling on the floor, praising very loudly. That's all considered ecstatic forms of worship. Using drums with singing and clapping. Came from Africa. Respecting and living in harmony with nature and the spirit of nature came from Africa. All right. I understand there are people who are literally running away from anything to do with their Africanness and their African roots. You can run, but I don't know how far you're going to get. This picture here, I want to uh, blow this up just a little bit so you can see this. This was called a Hush Harbor meeting. We talked about this in an earlier lecture. Beautifully drawn to depict what was happening in the woods. They weren't going out there sacrificing people. <laughs> they were doing, however, um, what Moses said to Pharaoh he said, um, can we go into the wilderness? Just give us three days. We want to just go out there and worship our God. And Pharaoh said, ah, ah. <laughs> no, you're not. What you're not going to do? You're not leaving. You're, you're not leaving. So this is a Hush Harbor meeting. Okay. You got uh, over here in the corner, lower uh, left-hand corner, you got the mother with her child. You got this woman here in the lower right-hand corner. She is bowed in prayer or praise. I'll blow it up a little bit more so you can see. You got people on their knees. You have two people reaching up to heaven here. 
you have the minister that is delivering his word and they are doing this in the woods. It was called a hush harbor because they had to be quiet. They were doing it in secret. For those of you all who keep saying that black people just went along with whatever they was told about God. The evidence is contrary to what you're saying. All right. African-American hoodoo and Afro-Christianity developed differently. I want you to hear this very clearly as we're closing today. And I'm going to leave. I do have some time to um, for us to talk. So we'll have about 15 minutes. At hoodoo and Afro-Christianity developed differently and was not, not influenced by European American Christianity because this is what a lot of black people keep getting told. That's the white man's religion. It was not influenced by European American Christianity as some African Americans continue to believe in the African concepts of nature, of spirit, as well as cosmology attributed to the Congo religion and the Congo cosmogram. So if you're asking yourself, what might be the purest form of what my ancestors, would, their practice would have been like, you're going to find it amongst the Gullah Geechee. This is Coffin Point Praise House, and I'm going to stop here today. Seeking and shouting, seeking and shouting. In a process known as seeking, a hoodoo practitioner will ask for salvation of a person's soul in order that a Gullah church will accept them. A spiritual leader will assist in the process and after believing the follower is ready, they will announce it to the church. A ceremony will commence with much singing and the practice of the ring shout. The word shout derived from the West African Muslim word sout, S-A-U-T, meaning dancing or moving around the Kaaba. The ring shout in black churches originates from African styles of dance. In hoodoo, African Americans perform the ring shout to become touched or possessed by the Holy Spirit. We would say filled with the Holy Spirit. And we'll pick up here on next time. All right. Let me go ahead and drop my link into the chat. We didn't get to uh, finish this section, we will come back and we'll pick up right there at the ring shout in part five. So let me drop my link. If you want to come in and join me backstage and I'll bring you on. There is my link if you would like to join in. And we set this up for more than one person. As we're waiting uh, for anyone who would like to come backstage and join me in conversation, I do want to thank you for your time and for your attention today. I hope that you have learned something new. I hope you have learned something that you didn't know about hoodoo and its practices. I hope you're gaining a better understanding on part four, we're going to pick up with the spiritual implications for hoodoo, and we're also going to look at where hoodoo is today and how hoodoo has entered into our medical field, our medical conversations, um, and the medical um, world. We'll be looking at that in part four. Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. Can you see and hear me? I can see and hear you. Awesome. 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 All right. Let's mm -hmm. remove our screen. There we go. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. All right. Take it away. What would you like to share with us? <laughs> oh, boy. 
this this was one of the best ones yet because it tied and I you know we keep having these conversations where people want to and our people want to insist that Christianity is a white man's religion when it's our history. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's our history. So, but then again, as we was discussing, as you were discussing today, as we, and as we discussed before, they claim what's ours. They'll put it down, they'll bash it, they'll demonize it, and then once we let it go a little bit, they grab it. They will grab it in a second. <laughs> and monetize it. And monetize it. And we're going to talk about that um, next next Tuesday. We're going to talk about the ways. And, and I, hope, I hope some people, I hope the light bulb is coming on for people as we're talking about this. Because when you start realizing how much has been stolen from you and repackaged, and resold back to you as somebody else's, it's probably going to make you a little angry. Mm -hmm. it, it, it might. It might make you a little angry to realize that it, and even in the lie, to me, it, it, it's a lie to say we lost all our, our, our ancestors lost all memory of who they were. Because it's clear in the practices that people keep demonizing that they didn't lose memory of who they were. Right. So now we have to ask the question, which we're going to get to on part four. We got to ask the question, what happened to those memories? What suppressed those memories? Why did our elders stop talking about certain things? Why did some of that information go underground and why don't you know it? Uh -huh. So uh -huh. I would encourage people, if you still have living elders, you still have grandma and great grandma, you need to be asking questions. Ask them about these practices. Ask them what do they remember? Ask them what herbs and roots that they already use and what do they use them for? Uh-huh. And why do I say that? Because somebody took the time to start documenting elders all over the United States. This is called working the roots. <laughs> Over 400 years of traditional African-American healing practices. But we look at the word root and we look at the word root worker and we automatically think devil, evil, satanic. <laughs> uh -huh. When that uh -huh. is not what roots are about, they're about healing practices and what our elders understood about how, what plants to use to heal yourself. And that's what it was about. Hence the now, word root. Now, who benefits from you not knowing this information? That's what you need to ask yourself. Pharmaceutical. Who okay. Pharmaceutical. <laughs> That's all I got to say. I'm going to recommend that you get this while you can still get it. Okay. It's called Working the Roots by Michelle E. Lee. Inside, I didn't, I didn't even touch on a lot of this, but inside... It's got the elders that they interviewed that talked about what do they use? Why do they use it? What herbs are healing? And then it's got a directory. It's got a directory of all of the things that people use and what they use it for. Uh -huh. Now, in the middle of the that thing that happened from 2019 all the way to the present that's still going on, when people couldn't get into a hospital, this would have been helpful. It would have been helpful, right? Well, it, it was helpful to some of us that knew, like you and I. 
and people that we knew that actually listened to us, it was helpful. Um, I, I think I shared this before. One of my son's clients, she's like a mother to him, uh, she had health issues anyway, so she was high risk. The doctor diagnosed her with COVID. He, he told her to go home and quarantine. Once he told me, I gave him a list of what for, for her to get, what to, how to use it and all that stuff. And she did that. When she went back to the doctor, the doctor told her, I don't know what you're doing, but never stop. It actually started, she actually started benefiting even with her, her illnesses that she had before, you know, COVID. She was, it, it stopped, she started benefiting health-wise from it. So, and it was all natural. Ginger, mm -hmm. Uh, all these types of different things, you know, raw honey, uh, lemon juice, all these natural stuff, natural stuff, and it worked. Yeah, I remember getting, I remember getting told by my doctor that I was a fool. Uh -huh. And I remember, um, I remember them telling me about someone that they had told to, to take the you know, that thing uh -huh. and young guy, you know, young doctor, he urged them to, to get it and they died the next week. And then, you know, of course, after everything has passed by, because every time I would go get a checkup, he'd be like, have you done, have you done the thing? And I'm like, no. And he would continue to, <laughs> he would continue to talk his stuff <laughs> And I just continued to tell him what I was doing. And finally, my last my last recent vis visit, he said, you know, you were right. If you if, mm -hmm. if you would have listened to me, you know, you probably wouldn't be doing as well as you are. So he finally admitted it. Finally. Mm -hmm. But it took me ignoring what he was saying. And doing what I knew to do for my body that actually worked. And um, I just looked at him and I said three words. Believe black women. <laughs> and I smiled. It blinked. And that was the end of that. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely doing better than he anticipated. And because of my own practices, I have to see him less until I don't want to see him anymore. But the point is, I'm uh -huh. seeing him less, less. And he's like, well, what are you doing? I was like, I'm doing the same thing I told you I was doing the last time I was here. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm doing the same thing I told you I was doing last time I was here. Um, and so, again, same thing with my husband. Um, you know, we, we do our practices together in terms of keeping our health together. And his doctors say the same thing, like they can't believe like, oh, my God, you don't have you're not on any of this stuff. You're not on anything. No high mm -hmm. blood pressure medicines, no nothing. Right. And they're like, what are you doing? And we tell them what we're doing. <laughs> and they're like, well, I can't prescribe any of that. And we're like, we know we know you can't. Right. And that's the problem. <laughs> I can't get paid for that because I can't prescribe right. it. Uh -huh. So, you know, again, we're going to continue to do what works for us in terms of keeping mm -hmm. our body together. But I encourage people. And, and, and that's why I said you can't let people use a word to scare you away from learning. And that is what I'm seeing a lot of. I'm seeing people. Ooh, she's talking about roots. Ooh, they're talking about root working. Ooh, they're talking about hoodoo. You better go find out what your ancestors was doing. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that I take on every practice? Does that mean that I believe everything that they were doing? Do I believe that there's some superstition mixed in with the truth? Mm -hmm. Right? But if I have if I have wisdom, I know how to do what? What is it the scripture tells us? Hold fast to that which is good. 
Uh-huh. Some of us throwing out everything. Yeah, well, this, this is the way we say it now. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I and there's a funny story behind that. Um, they used to they used to bathe children in the same bathwater, mm-hmm. and the baby used to be the last one to bathe, and the water would be so murky that sometimes they would not realize that the baby was in there. So they would throw the bath water out and the baby would still be in there. So that's where that phrase comes from. Don't mm-hmm. throw the baby out with the bath water. Uh, mm-hmm. Kimball says, I left the church and Christianity because I got tired of hearing that everything about black people was evil. They practiced European Christianity. Exactly. And I'm going to tell you this. Somebody ain't going to like it, but I got to say it. Almost everything that black people do in European Christianity is evil. Uh-huh. To them. Uh-huh. Because blackness is evil to uh-huh. them. Uh-huh. It's it's inherently evil. And uh-huh. therefore, um, it's going to be hard for people to listen to you in that space. It's going to be hard for, you, for people to allow you to do anything other than sing and tap dance and play a piano. Because their doctrines say you are inherently evil. Uh And a lot of them are not going to say those doctrines out loud, but they believe them in their heart. And I can tell they believe them in their heart by how they treat the black people in their spaces. Uh And how do I know that? Because I've been in those spaces and I've heard some of those doctrines outside of the pulpit. And I'm like, where do you get that from? (laughs) And then I've read some of those doctrines that come straight out of white supremacy. Uh And some of those doctrines say that black people were not born. They were not created on the same day as Adam and Eve. They were created with the beast of the field. Uh So if somebody believes that I'm inherently a beast, according to the way that they read scripture, then beasts are supposed to be dominated by humans. Hence their belief that you are beneath them and you are supposed to be dominated according to the way that they interpret and read scripture. And so some people can't figure out why they keep being treated a certain way. It's because they don't believe that you're human, sweetie. They don't believe you're human. They believe you are a beast of the field. And according to the text, the beast of the field was dominated by Adam and Eve. They don't believe you are a part of the Adamic line. They believe you are part of the beast of the field. And and here's the crazy part. They are more inhumane than who they're calling the beast. Yeah, that's going to be a whole other sermon. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to be a whole whole other show. Listen, and we ain't just saying that. There are white folks saying that also. So you know, it ain't just us saying something. You actually have white people actually doing videos saying that their heritage is murderers and destruction. They say those and, are our heritage. And here's and here's the thing about all of that, right? Because people would people would label that as something to do with your genetics, right? Or your or your epigenetics. And I often mm-hmm. tell people. That just like black people are dealing with the epigenetics of oppression, they're dealing with the epigenetics of destroying people. Uh So nobody is nobody is getting away with without having to do some work. Of some kind. So whether you are in the work of freeing yourself from the mindset of oppression and being oppressed, Uh And thinking that that is your lot in life or that is your end in life or whether you on the other side of that of freeing yourself from thinking that you're supposed to dominate everybody. And that people are beneath you. That's some work you need to do and work on for yourself. Uh If you feel like you always have to be in charge, you're always right. Nobody else is, is right. If you feel like you cannot rely on anything that black people are saying to you. You have a habit of 
second guessing black people, baby, that's epigenetics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's deep, 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 deep down on the inside of you. If you all over social media and every time you see a black person teaching or talking, you feel the need to question the validity of their own experience. Mm -hmm. That's an epigenetic issue. Yeah, that's epigenetics. That's not just normal. Right. Of thinking they are superior. That is an epigenetic issue. Because uh -huh. it was drained into you that you are superior to everyone else. So you got to You got to work on that. We might have to side of I'm not good enough, but y'all got some work to do on the other side, thinking that you better than everybody else. But you Final know what? That, that, that actually works against them because they're trying too hard to live up to a lie. Correct. See, and that's hard work. It's hard work to live a lie. Real hard work. You and know, not and, and not so only angry. and not only that. Yes, it is. It is producing a measure of anger because you told me I was superior. You told me I was the best. Mm -hmm. And now I find out I'm mediocre at best. Mm -hmm. And so I'm angry about that because I'm not able to attain this American dream that you've convinced me that number one, I deserve. And number two, I'm superior. So I must, it should be mine. And when you find out you're mm -hmm. not superior and you're mediocre and you're struggling, then yes, two things either happen despair which many of them sink into which is why the rate of unaliving is the way it is uh -huh. anger which leads to other people being unalive because you angry about the life that you're in because America lied and has been uh -huh. lying to you for quite a long time yeah. Pastor Ben we're going to end there I want to thank you for your time and attention this has been another episode of Daring Dialogues and I've been your host today Shante Charles Remember, light is the most daring opposition to darkness. So continue to go out and be light. We have been talking about hoodoo, origins, and understandings. This has been part three. Catch me right here next week, next Tuesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for part four. We might have to do a part five. I'm not sure, but we'll see how far we get on next week. Thank you again. Be well, and most importantly, be light.